our first workshop is going to be presented by Daniel E. Siebold, PRP, who is, is with us and on the line. Uh, Dr. Siebold is a mathematics professor at Hofstra University, specializing in logic and set theory. He is a graduate of McDaniel College and received his doctorate in mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Siebold has served as a member of the authorship team for Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised since 2008. He will speak to us on what it takes and how is it done to revise Robert's Rules. Dr. Siebold. Uh, I'm here today uh, really on account of a couple of emails that I received. The uh, more recent of the two emails I got, I think on July 3rd from Marilyn asking me if I could join you today and give this talk. But Perhaps the reason I got the second email is because of the first email, which I received in October of 2006. And I think if I'm gonna talk about revising Robert's rules, I should probably start there. Because that was the email that I received, very concise, very elegantly written email that said that the authorship team of Robert's Rules of Order newly revised was interested in exploring the possibility of my having a continuing association with that body. And if I would be so good as to pre present myself at the law offices of Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston in uh, Baltimore, Maryland on such and such a morning, uh, they would like to interview me. And uh, the question of exactly how this injustice came to be that I of all people should have gotten that email um, is worth explaining because it was a very much uh, surprising turn of events. Uh, in fact, uh, my involvement in parliamentary procedure, I'm, I want to say it probably began around the year 2000 when uh, I was sitting having lunch in a room that faculty would have lunch in and one of my senior colleagues wandered up to me and said, hey, Dan, I think you'd get a kick out of this. We need a faculty parliamentarian and we hold an election for a parliamentarian every couple of years, would you be willing to run? Well, right off the bat, the whole idea of an elected parliamentarian is an awfully strange thing to all of us. But I was a junior faculty member and I needed to put things onto my CV so I would get tenure and I said, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll run for parliamentarian. Who, who am I running against? And uh, my colleague just laughed and laughed and he said, you're not running against anyone. If we can get even one person to run, we consider that to be, you know, a real success. Half the time we don't even have a parliamentarian because no one will do it. So I, I became a parliamentarian in name only. I showed up to meetings. I knew nothing. Famously, General Robert began, uh, then, then Major Robert began his serious association with parliamentary procedure as a result of a bad meeting, a meeting that went, I forget how many hours it is, you've all read about it in the introduction, um, but uh, it was a very contentious matter that went on very long. He didn't know what he was doing. It was a serious business relating to uh, uh, civil defense, and he made a decision that it was time for him to learn about parliamentary procedure. In my case, the bad meeting was not quite so serious, but our university houses a an ROTC unit. And this was back in the days of the don't ask, don't tell policy. And there were faculty who believed that that policy put us in conflict with our own in, internal rules regarding non-discrimination. And it was a very contentious meeting. Uh, and, and people were saying, I move to rescind this. I move to take a ballot vote. Things that I had never really contemplated. I was quite lost. And so, I decided to set aside Webster's Concise Guide to Robert's Rules, which I had been given upon my election, get a copy of the correct book and begin reading it. And then I began haunting an online forum, the Robert's Rules Forum, which some of you may be familiar with. If you're not, I, I would advise you to, to, to visit it at some point. It's uh, maintained by the Robert's Rules Association, which is the Association of descendants of General Robert, who owned the copyright to the book. Uh, and it is frequented by a number of members of the authorship team over the years at different times. And I began asking questions on that forum. 
and learning a lot. In particular, I learned a great deal from Dan Hunneman, who is the person who sent me that concise and elegant email much later. Uh, after I had been involved in the forum for a couple of years, uh, I got an, a, an email from, from Dan that was uh, kind of, it sounded like a little bit of a joke. I should explain by way of background that uh, from time to time, people would ask questions on the forum that no one could give a satisfactory answer to. If you spend a lot of time with parliamentary procedure, that's not hard to do. You can come up with questions that no one really has a good answer to. And if Dan Hunneman did not produce an answer that he was satisfied with, he would say, well, we'll just have to put that on the agenda for the advanced seminar. And people really got very excited about this. They said, well, when's this advanced seminar coming? You know, we really want to go to the advanced seminar. Well, it was just a joke. It was a joke like the two-fisted parliamentarians club that he always talked about. In any event, the Roberts Rules Association decided it was going to hold an advanced seminar after all. And I was invited to speak at it, presumably based upon my participation in the forum. Shmuel Gerber was invited to speak at it and several other people were. So we all went down to Baltimore and there was an advanced seminar. Maybe one or two of you may have even attended it. It was widely publicized. And afterwards, I sat around. I got to meet John Redgrave, who was a great grandson of General Robert and a first cousin once removed of, of our Henry Robert. I uh, had a couple of drinks with Dan Hunneman. And I went home. I had given my talk and I was done. And it was uh, a, about a week after that that I received the email that I described from Dan. And it wasn't until much later that I learned that the whole advanced seminar had been a bit of a ruse. Apparently, the authors had decided that it was time to add some more people to the team. And they thought this was a good way to get to know some people. So they had invited half a dozen people to come to give talks. And uh, as a result of that talk, I was, I was asked to interview. Uh, I, I, Never been so nervous for an interview in my life. Even the job I have at Hofstra University, I wasn't as nervous about my interview. I actually spent the several days leading up to my interview uh, rereading cover to cover the entirety of parliamentary law, which is the book that uh, General Robert wrote in the 1920s. It was his final statement on parliamentary procedure. I also read the prefaces to the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th editions because they give some insight as to the kinds of changes that are made in the publication of each new edition. So, uh, I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into. I went to the interview. It was a very strange interview. Uh, it was a very different kind of interview than would happen if it was a regular employment situation. I think they asked me some things that are illegal to ask. Uh, they would be illegal if, if I asked them. Uh, if you came into my office, I'm actually the chair of the Department of Mathematics. If you came into my office looking for a job and I asked you whether you were married, I would be in trouble. I have lawyers here who work at the university whose job it is to tell me how much trouble I'd be in. But they wanted to know whether I was married and what my wife did for a living and how many kids did I have and do they like soccer? And, you know, I, it was very, you know, they wanted to know who I was. They wrote all of the, and everything Burke Walsh just sat there and wrote it all down, like, because he, he had to make this report to the Roberts Rules Association. Well, at any event, when we got down to it, they handed me a couple of interpretations of, uh, of the book, places where there were maybe gaps in the book and they were considering making changes. They asked me to read them and comment on them. And then we stopped and we went to lunch. And a week later, I received a, a, an email saying, we'd like to offer you to the, jo the job. We'd like you to join the authorship team, but this will need to be approved by the Roberts Rules Association and that may take a while. My appointment to the authorship team of, of Roberts Rules of Order newly revised was approved by the Roberts Rules Association one and a half years later. It took them from the fall of 2006 until the spring of 2008. And I've never gotten much of an explanation, but John Redgrave, who was at that time the author's agent, said, don't take it personal. He said, there just uh, it takes a very long time. Uh, many members, they're scattered across the country. Half of them don't have email. I think they're writing with feathered quills and 
and hiring messengers to take things back and forth by foot. I have no idea. And in fact, uh, it was a rather compressed timeline to produce the uh, uh, 11th edition, which is what I want to talk about now. The uh, 11th edition, as you know, was published in 2011. Uh, many people were upset because it was published at the time of a convention and people felt that they should know the rules uh, well before the convention. Uh, it was in fact delayed a year because it took so long to get Schmuel's uh, and, and my addition to the authorship team approved. Um, I think, let me see if I can, there we go. There we go. To talk a little bit about the process of producing a new edition, which occurs uh, roughly every 10 years. And I'll, and I'll focus here on the timeline for the 11th edition. The way to understand what we do when we produce a book is to start at the end and go backwards. Uh, the goal was to have that book into your hands by August of 2011. To make that happen, the manuscript had to be given over to the publisher on, in August 2010. It took them a full year to go through uh, a whole series of, first off, convert it into something printable, have us review it through several uh, uh, passes, and then get it printed. Uh, in order to have the manuscript to the publisher by August of 2010, we actually took two years from 2008 to 2010 considering changes initially, and then a period of about half a year prior to submitting the manuscript for reconsideration. So I wanna talk about what these stages involve. Uh, in, in case you were ever wondering, if, if you were never wondering, then, then this may drag a little bit for you, but let me walk you through what we do. I imagined when I joined the authorship team that this would be a kind of a top-down arrangement. Namely, I thought that the three senior members of the authorship team, uh, Henry Robert, Dan Hunneman, and Burke Balsh, would establish broad priorities for the new edition, and then the work would sort of be parceled out to various people to work on. It's nothing like that. It is entirely a bottom-up process. If there is a change in the book, it's because one individual member proposed that change and it just sort of bubbles up and people get ideas from various sources. We'll talk about that in a minute. These proposals to make changes, which are frequently written in, in strikeout and insert form and, and, and uh, sort of delicately defended in argument are circulated beforehand by email, except that Henry uh, didn't do so well with email. Burke would often uh, uh, drive to Henry's house with printouts for him. Uh, all, that's from Fred, Fredericksburg to Annapolis, by the way. You can look on a map if you don't know where that is. So that's what we would do. Um, we would circulate these proposals. There would be email discussion. Counter proposals would be made. Sometimes there might be a substantive disagreement about something. Other times it might just be wording changes. And these could go on for a while. And then we would have face-to-face -face meetings. The face-to-face -face meetings would take place at a hotel in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, typically lasts for two to five days. Now, because of the compressed schedule of having to do this in two years, we were meeting uh, almost every month. Uh, it was very, very heavy workload at that time. These tentatively adopted changes were then recorded. As I say, that went on for two years, and then we enter into a reconsideration phase. The, the rule is that nothing is final until we've had a chance to, to, to review it. We would each individually, starting on page one, reread the entire book with all the changes we had proposed. A big reason we do this is to identify conforming changes, because when you make a change on page 37, you find out that there's another reference to the same rule on page 517. Uh, this is often very difficult to catch if you don't reread the whole book. I don't like this, because when I'm giving talks on bylaws, as I often have, I always say, if you want good bylaws, say each thing once, say it in the right place, and say it clearly. ROR doesn't say each thing. It doesn't say each thing once. It, it says things ten times. 
But that's partly because of the way it's constructed. The first part of the book is really uh, a kind of a general introduction, and then you get into more detail later. So um, uh, an idea, for example, of committing something might come up in the first few chapters, again, in detail in the section on the motion to commit, and then uh, a third time in the section on committees. So identifying conforming changes so we don't get any inconsistencies in the book is, is our number one priority. The second thing we're trying to do is to clean up the language. I cannot tell you how many times we've been sitting in a meeting arguing over the wording, struggling to get something clean, and then finally someone says, look, let's just adopt it the way this is. We will clean this up in reconsideration. So it's actually during that reconsideration phase that we transform our, our ugly prose into the beautiful poetry that you know and love from Robert's Rules. Uh, the third thing we do is we repent our sins. And this is the closest I'm gonna come to saying something that'll get me in trouble with Burke. But uh, in fact, there were things that we agree to do and we get to the end and we say, mm, I'm not sure that was a good idea. And on reconsideration, we reverse the, the uh, vote initially adopting it. So that's, a, that's about a six month process uh, to go through. And we had a similar process for the 12th edition. Uh, then we submit the manuscript and we're done, right? I, this is one of those great examples of the old saying that the first 90% of a job takes 90% of the time and the last 10% of the job takes the other 90% of the time. Uh, I'm in a particularly foul mood on this point right now because this is where we are with the 12th edition. Um, we're still doing work, believe it or not, uh, related to the ebook, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes. But after the manuscript is submitted, they take our, which our manuscript is literally a, a Microsoft Word document in strikeout and insert form. And they turn it into uh, proofs, that is PDFs of what each page will actually look like. We then have to read that and, and find the mistakes. We have to find the places where um, uh, something's supposed to be in boldface and it isn't, where the spacing is wrong in terms of a title, where um, uh, you know something got pushed off a page incorrectly. Uh, often we have to respond to uh, various uh, comments and questions by the publisher. We have to correct the cross references. This has been a huge job. Uh, as you know, previous editions of R.O.N.R. have had both page and line references, hundreds and hundreds of them. When you modify the book, every single page and line reference changes. So you have to find the new location for that and replace it. And there's even dumb stuff like selecting the, the cover color, you know, what font we want headings to be in, the layout and things like this. Uh, it is an enormous amount of time. Um, Typically, we refer to our review of the proofs as passes. We receive a full PDF of the entire book. We review it. That's called the first pass. We say, these are the changes we need. They implement the changes, and then we look at it again. That's the second pass. For the 12th edition, we went through seven passes. Uh, and hopefully, we got it right. We'll, we'll see. You'll, you'll know in a few days. Uh, even after it's published, there's some post-publication work. Uh, as you, you may know, there was a CD-ROM uh, produced of the 11th edition. Uh, there were special files we had to prepare for that. There will also be, I don't know about a CD-ROM, I think you'll be able to get it on a USB drive or as a download, and we'll have to do that after uh, publication. We also prepare a list of changes for the website and typically prepare uh, some sort of a presentation to give to the NAP. So the work continues. Once all that's done, six months after publication, two years will go by and I won't even talk to Burke. <laughs> or Shmuel. Maybe, maybe we'll send each other an email on our birthdays, but, uh, but then we start up again. So the in brief schedule works very much like the R.O.N.R. schedule. It's the same kind of thing. It's published simultaneously with R.O.N.R., but the schedule is shifted a little bit later, and the most of the changes in in brief are actually driven by changes in R.O.N.R. So in fact, you'll see that there was very little difference between the first and second ed editions of in brief, and there will again be very little difference between the second and third editions. 
Okay, now we get to the fun part, right? The great thing about being a member of the authorship team for Robert's Rules of Order newly revised is we can change anything we want, right? We can simply look at parliamentary law with a fresh eye and anything we think sounds good, we can do. Unfortunately, that's not the case. In fact, even the contract, this is true, I should, I should pull out my contract, I'm not quite sure where it is right now. I have a contract with Roberts Rules Association which emphasizes our duty to remain faithful to the text and not make substantive changes willy-nilly to it. Uh, here is what Henry Roberts said uh, when the 11th edition was published. He said, uh, this was a speech he actually gave at the convention. He said, there is an ever-present temptation many of us must feel, to think of altered rules which one believes would be better than the rules uh, as they exist. Oops. But much as the court is supposed to interpret, clarify, and apply the law, not change it, the authorship team does not consider itself free to make changes simply in accordance with the policy preferences of its members, without regard to precedent or common practice. Okay, well, if Henry Roberts says, we've got to be real careful about changing the book, the question is, how do we change it at all? Where do the ideas come for changes? How do we come up with uh, possible changes? What are the rules for doing it? So let me try to give you the general framework. Uh, first off, uh, changes to uh, an edition of R O N R are based upon problems that people perceive. And there are a few different places that these problems uh, get noted. One excellent source, and, and I, I promise you it has driven many changes, is the ROINR forum. Uh, this is, again, the forum I was referring to before. Uh, there's both an advanced forum and a general forum. Uh, Dan Honeyman and Shmuel Gerber in particular are very frequently on those forums. And they take note of the kinds of problems people bring up. And when something arises that can't easily be addressed based upon the current edition, proposals are made to modify the edition. We also receive large numbers of private communications. Many of you are probably aware that uh, in PL, General Roberts' book, there's a Q&A section at the very end. And that Q&A se uh, section consists of General Roberts' uh, efforts to answer questions that were written to him over the years. I get emails all the time from people, uh, I'm all the time, I get, a, I get multiple a year, uh, and people come up to me at NAP conven conventions and say, you should change this, you should change that, and other people do as well. So that's another source of problems to be addressed. Third source is consulting practices. Uh, I'm going to give an example. Again, I don't know if I'm telling you something you're not supposed to know, but uh, uh, you may be aware that Burke Balsh works with a lot of political organizations. And you may be aware that political organizations are sometimes contentious. And there were very extensive changes in the 11th edition to add disciplinary proceedings in. And a lot of that was driven by concerns that uh, came up in, in the course of his practice. Uh, quite a few of the problems that we identify are really nothing more than close reading. It's just when you become very, very familiar with a book, you finally notice that there's some little inconsistency between page 6, 617 and page 435. And so we, we, we come up with problems that way. When we find a problem, we have to solve it. Um, there are various places we look if we're not sure what the rule is or ought to be. In some cases, uh, we may draw from the practices of the House of Representatives, uh, which uh, there's a, there are whole encyclopedia sets uh, full of precedents, which are available online. We may look at earlier editions of ROR, ROR, and RO, as well as PL. And we may look elsewhere in the current edition for ideas. Um, I, you know, I guess I should say, you know, the, the whole point here is that we, we, we don't want to make too extensive changes. We want to maintain the legitimacy of the book because if we make a, a changes that seem to be driven by our own preferences, people will take the book less seriously because they'll just simply see it as changing every 10 years according to the preferences of whoever happens to be an authorship team. Also, we want to provide a certain amount of stability for users. Uh, again, 
people were very, very unhappy to learn that the rules were changing just before the 11th uh, edition came out, uh, when the 11th edition came out just before the convention of the NAP. Uh, people don't want large, extensive rule changes. They want the rules to be essentially the same. So here's a list of five bases on which the book might be changed. This is again from writings of Henry Robert. Uh, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'll go through these each. I don't want to give you the impression that when we propose a change that we necessarily identify one of these five and make that justification. But these are the five that are sort of lurking in our minds when we talk over the potential changes. So uh, the five bases for potentially changing the parliamentary manual are first, we apply existing principles of parliamentary law to newly arising questions resulting in more fully developed rules derived through the technique of interpretation. Secondly, we change the book to take account of new practices that through repeated and widespread use have become established. Third, we attempt to correct inconsistencies or ambiguities in the existing work. Fourth, we make alterations in arrangement or method of presentation in an ongoing effort to make the book ever more useful. And fifth, we give clearer or more emphatic explanations to mitigate harm done by common misunderstandings. Now, technically, the, the contents of the 12th edition are really embargoed until the official publication date. So I'm going to try to illustrate each of these five principles with just a couple of examples drawn from earlier editions, primarily uh, drawn from the 11th edition. So let's take that first one, which is applying existing principles of parliamentary law to newly arising questions. Okay, so a good example here is to talk about electronic meetings, probably one of the biggest uh, changes in our experience of parliamentary law in the last 20 years has been the rise in electronic meetings. So how did we take existing principles of parliamentary law to address this? If you go back to the ninth edition, the word meeting, one of those fundamental terms that you, you have to learn the first day you're studying parliamentary law, uh, meeting is defined as taking, uh, a meeting is defined as taking place in one room or area. Well, right now, our meeting is not taking place in one room or area. It's taking place all over Arizona and in New York. So how do you begin to expand the, the rules of the book? In the 10th edition, it says the group meets in a single room or area under equivalent conditions of opportunity for simultaneous oral communication among all participants. There is that lovely Robert's Rules poetry for you. So what are the key words here? In the 10th edition, they recognized people might not be in a single room or area, but they emphasized that it had to be under equivalent conditions. And the key word here is simultaneous. This is very, very important. Those of you who remember what it was like uh, not so many years ago, there was a lot of talk about asynchronous meetings, how to expand the rules of parliamentary law to email meetings and fax meetings and things like that. And this was really staking out the turf and saying, no, parliamentary law is about simultaneous uh, communication. Because it only says oral. This meeting isn't just oral, it's also visual. It did mention the possibility, again, we're in the 10th edition here, this is published in 2000 of a video conference when it's authorized by the bylaws regulated by appropriate rules. And it did say that the asynchronous processes of email and fax are not suitable. It didn't say a whole lot other than that. And it kind of left you on the low, on your own. What, what kinds of appropriate rules would you need? So in the 11th edition, we began really looking systematically for the first time at parliamentary law and saying, what happens in a meeting that requires you and me to be in the same room? And how does that work when you are not in the same room? How do you take the existing practices of parliamentary law and let them evolve into that situation? So now we say that electronic meetings are meetings at which rather than all participating members being physically present in one room or area as in traditional or face-to-face -face meetings, some or all of them communicate with the others through electronic means such as the internet or by telephone. Again, there's a lot packed into that. Some or all is a big deal. 
sometimes some people are in the room and some people are calling in. What are these additional rules that we need? Well, the bylaw provision had better say whether members have the right to participate electronically and whether members have the right to participate in person. Can you demand that you're going to call into the board's meeting? Or do you only get to call in if the board votes and decides that it's going to hold that telephone meeting? These kinds of things have to be made clear. Notice, previous notice is something in the existing rules coming out of the 10th edition. How do we expand that to talk about electronic meetings for the 11th edition? Well, notice has to say how to participate in the meeting. It's no longer about where and when, it's about what number do you call? Additional rules need to address it. what kind of equipment needed, who will provide it in contingencies. Okay, if Ray Harwood's computer cuts out, if he loses his internet connection, what does that mean? Are we obliged to wait until he can reconnect? Have his basic rights as an individual member to participate in this meeting and to vote on motions in it? Uh, have those rights been deprived? This has to be addressed. We need a method to determine the presence of a quorum. Uh, we need to talk about when members may raise a point of order regarding a quorum and when quorum is presumed. Methods for seeking recognition and obtaining a floor. The next one is a biggie. It means for submitting a motion in writing. Guess what? Your presiding officer could insist that that main motion that you want to move be submitted in writing because she needs to know exactly what the words are. Maybe she can't hear you. How does that happen when you're dealing with things electronically? How do you take and verify votes? So again, it wasn't that we were sort of making things up as we go along, but we're identifying existing principles of parliamentary law that have to be extended uh, into the new uh, area. Uh, the second example, and again, I'm still talking about applying existing principles of parliamentary law to newly arising questions. We were attempting, this is a great example of how conversation on the r, &R forum could, contributes to the development of parliamentary law. Because we were getting uh, post after post after post from people saying, my board did this, my board did that, the membership decided one thing, the board decided to do something else, we're in a fight. Now, the 10th edition had said that uh, no action of the board can conflict with any action taken by the assembly of the society. Does that sound clear? Sounds clear to me. It's not clear. It's not clear enough. People were saying, well, no action of the board can conflict with any action taken by the assembly. Well, if the assembly voted the motion down, the board can just adopt it anyway because the membership didn't really take action when they voted something down. You only take action when you vote something up. That's what people were saying. They were saying no action of the board can conflict with any action, but what if the board just rescinds that action? Is that really a conflict? We're getting this all the time. So the 11th edition was written to clarify this. In any event, no action of the board can alter or conflict with any decision made by the assembly of the society and any such action of the board is null and void. A board may never alter a decision of the society's assembly, even by a motion to rescind or amend something previously adopted or by adoption of a proposal which has been rejected unless expressly authorized by the superior body. So this was a, a, a big point of clarification. This could also fall under the fifth item that I mentioned of giving clearer, or more emphatic explanations to mitigate harm. But some of these questions really had never been addressed in any uh, book uh, in the Roberts uh, opus. It had never been made crystal clear that when your assembly votes a motion to endorse Smith for president, that the board can't just turn around and adopt the motion that the assembly has voted down. That had never been made crystal clear. <clears throat> um, another area where we uh, just sort of drew on existing principles within the book to address questions that kept arising was in, in the area of challenging elections and establishing time limits for recounts and changing and challenging votes. This was a big point of clarification in the 11th edition. And again, it really came up because again and again, people on the forum were just saying, 
our organizations are getting more and more litigious. They're challenging the elections and we need clearer and more extensive detailed rules for handling those challenges. The second category of changes I mentioned were those that take account of new practices that through repeated and widespread use have become established. This is a really fun one. You think no one looks at the House of Representatives anymore, but here it is. In 1999, the House changed its standard form for putting the question. They used to say, the speaker used to say, as many as are in favor of the motion say aye. And now they say those in favor of the motion say aye. And so the 10th edition of Robertson Rules, Rules made the same change. It took account of that changing practice. And I hate this change, by the way. I don't, I don't chair a lot of meetings, but when I do, I would much prefer to say as many as are in favor of the motion say aye. I like that better. Other changes in this category, you may have made use of a stand at ease. The chair needs to consult with a parliamentarian. The assembly will stand at ease. That was introduced in the 10th edition to, to reflect the, the changing practices of parliamentarians around the country. Is there any debate? That's wrong, right? You're supposed to say, you know, are you ready for the question, right? But in the 11th edition, this changing practice of asking people, is there any debate was recognized. Another, uh, uh, obviously in the 11th edition, the book took note of the fact that people were starting to send their notices for meetings out by email. So a notice can be sent by a form of, of electronic commu communication by which the member has agreed to receive notice. That required 15 conforming changes in the book. Third category is probably the most critical. It's inconsistencies or ambiguities. I hope you find very few of these in the 12th edition. Uh, no one likes to find out that page 45 says one thing and page 617 says something else. That's frustrating, uh, but it does happen. Um, so one example is there was some ambiguity or really a kind of a theoretical inconsistency in the book in regard to motions that conflict with law. Back in the 10th edition, um, uh, a change was made to reflect the fact that uh, a parliamentary procedure is really about procedure. It's not about substance. The parliamentarian should be advising you on how to make certain types of decisions, but not on what the decision should be. So it used to say that when the uh, uh, assembly took action in violation with law, that action was null and void. That was never the intention. The intention was when an assembly takes an action that is in violation of a procedural rule in law, that action is null and void. And so this was, uh, this was an ambiguity that was clarified. I'll give you a quick example of that. Let's say you're advising a school board and the school board operates under sunshine laws that say that uh, you, know, you, can't, you can't go into executive session and kick everybody out. Or maybe you can only do it if there are personnel matters uh, pending. So a motion to go into executive session in that case is out of order. On the other hand, let's say that a student group at that school has a, adopts a motion to stage in a sit-in, and the sit-in involves criminal trespass. That motion is in violation of the law, right? I move that we engage in a sit-in, even though it violates the trespassing laws. Your parliamentarian should be saying nothing on that because that's not a procedural matter, that's a substantive matter. And that was the point that was clarified in the, in the 10th edition. This is a real inside baseball one. Um, the 10th edition said there were four ways for business to go over from one session to the next, by being postponed or made a special order, by being laid on the table, by being the subject of a motion to reconsider made but not called up by being referred to a committee. There was a, <laughs> It was just an error. There was an omission. There's a fifth way for business to go over, and that is by being unfinished business. Uh, this it had to be changed like five or six different places in the book. It was just quite simply an error. It was an oversight, and no one noticed it for years. 
Okay, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, changes in methods of presentation, probably the most visible one for you is you may know that in the 10th edition published in 2000, line numbers were added to the book to make it easier to give references to specific locations on a page. Um, uh, another change to presentation was breaking out the request to be excused from a duty into its very own section. Go look at a copy of the ninth edition. It doesn't have its own section there. It was just in that list of requests and inquiries with all the others. Another example in the 11th edition, a, a new table was added, table eight, uh, rules for counting election ballots. More than these though, we actually spent a lot of time just rewriting things. Um, for the 11th edition, for example, we substantially rewrote the section on counting ballots. We didn't really change anything. It just, we read it over and said, this is kind of confusing. Let's reorder the sentences and make it a little clearer. And there, that, that, there's a fair amount of that that goes on. Um, fifth, uh, occasionally uh, changes are made to uh, mitigate the harm that are done by common misunderstandings. Many of you are aware that people had been using the point of information in order to interrupt debate and supply information, here's what I think, rather than to request information. Point of information has its high uh, ability to interrupt uh, 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 discussion, it's, it's high, uh, precedes high priority because the person is actually seeking information. And so the name of this was changed from point of information to request for information. Now you may say, well, who, what gives you the right to change the name of something like that? In fact, request for information had been the name of this motion. If you go back into the earlier editions, it was called a request for information. At some point, the authors had taken into account changing practices by changing the name to point of information because that's what people were calling it. And then we changed it back because it was causing confusion. Uh, ratification in cases of emergency. Back in the 10th edition, it used to say, uh, uh, the book said, where an important opportunity would be lost unless acted upon immediately, the members present can at their own risk act in the emergency with a hope that their action will be ratified uh, by a later meeting. So the classic example is you have to pay the uh, utility bills. You have to pay uh, for the fuel oil. And the bill is due but it's a snowy day and not enough people come at the meet, to the meeting. You don't have a quorum, what do you do? Well, you go ahead and, and, and authorize the treasurer to pay the bill anyway. And then you hope, you cross your fingers that that motion will be ratified. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is we found out that these words act in the emergency were confusing people. People were thinking that ratification was only in order after the president had ruled that there was an emergency. Point of order, Madam Chair, we cannot ratify this because there's no emergency or we can't take this action because there's no emergency. That, that's not correct. It's not a procedural issue. It's a substantive issue. If you don't have a quorum, you can adopt anything you want. It's completely null and void until it gets ratified. So you, the, the assumption is that you wouldn't be so foolish as to take action in the name of the society in the hope that it would later be ratified unless there is an emergency. But the presence or absence of emergency isn't something that anybody has to rule on. And this was causing a lot of confusion on the forum. Uh, we get to the 12th edition. Can, can you guys see me? Can you just see my screen or can you see me? I can see both. Okay, ready? Ooh. Yeah, like it? Like it? Yes. That's the, that's the book. I think this arrived yesterday. Uh, I, I didn't open up the box that has the, hard, the hardback ones, but they're sitting, uh, I think, in my kitchen right now. And I got the in brief books a few days ago. So this is the 12th edition. And uh, I'm not supposed to tell you what's in this book, but um, okay, ready? Let's take a quick look. 
there it is. You've now seen the entire contents of the 12th edition. If this is being recorded, you can, you can go slow-mo and see how much of it you can read. Um, this book uh, it was uh, done under the same uh, uh, basis as the 11th edition. The primary difference in, in producing this book is that we had a lot more time um, uh, because we didn't, we didn't have the, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of uh, having only two years. We were able to spread it out over five or six years. We were able to meet uh, less frequently, have more time to go over it. Uh, I'll just mention very briefly a couple of things that I can tell you about the book. Uh, we changed the color. That's number one. Um, actually, the most visible change, and I and I, I think I can show you this. Uh, actually, I don't know if you can. I don't know if this depends on how big it is. When you look at the book, what you're going to find out is that in the uh, left-hand margins, uh, there are going to be paragraph numbers. We've done away with the line numbers and now have paragraph numbers. The main reason that was done was to make it possible to produce an electronic edition. The problem with eBooks is that the text has to be reflowable because you can modify the font size. And as soon as you do that, you lose an effective concept of a line of text. So you can no longer say line 12 of page 79. You can't even say page 79. So what you have to do instead is number the paragraphs. That took an enormous amount of work, but we eliminated the line numbers and put in paragraphs. And uh, those are used for cross references everywhere in the book. In most instances, that actually makes the book uh, more precise rather than less precise. Uh, most of the uh, uh, cross references within the book previously had been um, to page numbers without line numbers. So the addition of paragraph numbers are actually much better. Um, then, um, of course, uh, we will have an electronic edition of both InBrief and RONR. I'm still involved in reviewing those uh, um, uh, files right now. Um, there was an edition, you may be familiar with the sample rules for electronic meetings that had been posted, um, uh, they've been part of the CD-ROM, I should say, that was produced for the 11th edition. Those have been added as an appendix. Uh, in light of the pandemic, um, uh, been added uh, at the end of the twelfth um, uh, edition. Um, trying to think, we handed in the manuscript uh, months ago. Actually, you know, it, the book is obviously out now, and uh, I, uh, the ebook still, you know, it exists in electronic form, and and hopefully they'll be they'll be downloading those within a few weeks. Uh, I've actually forget what the publication date is. I think it might be September first. Uh, okay, so that's really all I've got to say. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions uh, that you might have uh, about this. So, Dr. Siebold, we really appreciate your, your insight and um, what happens to revisions um, and, and why. You know, wh why do they occur and, and why are the changes made? Uh, Dr. Siebold, uh, thank you, first of all. Thank you so much for all the work you've put into this. Your question, question I have might be a little bit scary. Do you ever worry that there might be anything that's gotten through that would require fixing on a second printing? <laughs> uh, lots of things get through, I'm sure, that require fixing. In fact, uh, I can tell you we, we got our, this is a silly thing, this isn't what you mean, but we got our in brief books a couple days ago and and uh, Shmuel Gerber, who has an eagle eye for these things, almost instantly discovered a printing error in which a uh, a gray bar that's supposed to surround some words got printed in black, so the words aren't visible. Uh, but that's that's not really going to cause any harm, and it will be fixed on the second printing. Um, there are mistakes that get in and do get fixed the next edition. I I I'm not. Yeah. I don't know. It's not something that keeps me up at night. But yeah, I mean, that's that's really why we have that reconsideration process. But I'm sure we're going to find things someday and say, you know, I'm not sure that was the right idea right there. It's a, it's a very long book. And it's one of the things actually that makes it very difficult is that when you read a section of R&R, in your mind, you're applying it to situations that you personally are familiar with or whatever you're facing today. And what you may not realize is that it has to apply to, to 
a much, much broader range of situations. So, so something looks like it's correct because in this particular scenario, it's correct. And then you realize that when you apply it to a different set of circumstances, it produces precisely the opposite result. That's the kind of thing that worries me. Um, but I can't recall, at least I've only been involved since the 11th edition, I can't recall any case where a substantive change was made between editions, except I think that the word not got changed to now, or now got changed to not in a typo that got fixed. And, and that, that really had a substantive effect, but it, it was buried somewhere in reconsider. <laughs> and Shmuel would remember what it was. I would. Not bad for 744 pages worth of text. Oh, it's fewer pages now. I didn't show you this. I got it. Can you see? Here's. Mm -hmm. nah, I can't yes. Do yes. Oh, yes. Definitely different. Yeah, it's it's small. It's it's bigger now. So that we cheated. We made the book bigger so people can't give us a hard time about how long it is. It's fewer pages now. Thank you. A little marketing ploy. I have a question. All right. Yes, go ahead. Uh, is that Susan? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, very informative. Um, what I'd like to know is for me to find substantive changes from 11 to 12, yeah. must I start reading on page I um, and just start comparing? Or is there a summary where I might go that use it to find uh, where the differences are between the two? Yeah, um, there will be a summary. In fact, uh, I got one today. Uh, Burke <laughs> emailed me this morning with his updated list of important changes from the 11th to 12th edition. Uh, in my copious spare time, I need to review that, um, as will Shmuel and Dan. And that will be posted on a new R&R website. The old Roberts Rules website has been substantially redesigned and we anticipate launching a, a new and, and much slicker looking website um, with the publication of the new edition. But uh, if, you, if you've ever looked at the, at the current website, there, there is or was uh, an extensive list of changes um, uh, that was posted there from the 10th to 11th edition. The, uh, the preface also lists um, changes, uh, but the preface has a short list. The preface, let me, let me see. Yeah, actually, the preface is fairly long. It's about two full pages listing 22 changes um, to it. But then the, but the, full, the full version that's going to go on the website will probably list 120, be my guess. I was wondering, will be a, there be a spiral edition of the book? There is. Yeah, my understanding is yes. Uh, the spiral edition is not produced by Hashet, which is our publisher. What happens is they have an agreement with NAP and they supply unbound pages to the NAP and then NAP oh, goes to another organization which drills the holes and it makes the spiral bound thing. But yeah, my okay. understanding is that that will happen. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, if I'm hearing you correctly, the new edition will not be available by the time of the national conference at the end of August? You know, th this is the kind of thing, th this is the part of the authorship team meetings where I don't pay as much attention as others do. Uh, there, there are many, you'd be much better off if you'd asked Burke to give this talk than me. There's no question about it. He's, uh, I, I think the answer is uh, yes, it will be available. I think we have a kind of a special arrangement with the NAP. But the, pro the problem is, obviously, the, the convention or uh, the NTC was to take place in San, San Antonio. I was looking forward to that. Um, but, um, uh, and, and they would have drop shipped however many 500,000 copies of, of the book to you. But because you're going to be scattered all over the, over the country, I don't know how the NAP is getting your book to you. Because I think a lot of you bought the book through the NAP. Yeah. Also, there are book plates that are going in. Obviously, we won't all be in one place to sign the books, but um, uh, members of the authorship team have signed book plates. And I think those book plates are being distributed, about 500 of them, 
with copies of R O N R. But all I know is if I have my book, then there are other books that are being shipped to the NAP, but how they're going to get them to you and, and when you're going to get them, uh, Darlene might be able to tell you. I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Sure. This is Vivian Vincent. Uh, I want to thank you. This was amazing. Um, in my travels as district eight director in the past, um, I was always amazed to hear the people talk about NAP's RONR. And when I explained to them that NAP does not have the authorship rights to uh, RONR, they were always amazed, but they're all very confused. Uh, I just want to ask, at the NTC, the end of August, um, as you did with the 2011, are the authors going to um, go over the changes? There were, you had several different times during at the convention when the, to, the uh, 11th edition rolled out. Is that right. what you're planning on doing the first day of the NTC? Uh, I don't recall if it's the first day or not. The schedule is out and, and I ought to take a good look at it, but uh, Shmuel Gerber, Burke, Balsh, and myself uh, are intending to uh, uh, give a, a presentation. Uh, and the details of that, I don't think uh, have entirely been worked out, but I assume it'll be like this. I assume we'll just be sort of zooming and talking and then there'll be an opportunity for questions like this. Uh, Dan Honeyman will not participate in that. So uh, that's that's the plan. And that, of course, that's where we'll actually, you know, I presented mostly changes from the 10th to 11th edition. That's where we'll talk in detail about the changes from the 11th to the 12th. Yeah, thank you so Plus much. Good to see you. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks in San Antonio online. I had a question. This is an issue that one of my organizations has. Um, you mentioned the distinction between advising the presiding officer on substance as opposed to process. Um, well, we have an issue where subjects are specifically barred in our bylaws from being discussed, uh, political, for example. Yeah. And if somebody makes a motion, well, let's invite the mayor, blah, blah, blah. Is that not something the uh, parliamentarian should remind the presiding officer of it's a subject, but it's also in the bylaws that this is not something that should be done. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if, if, if you have rules, procedural rules that say this particular uh, motion is out of order, then certainly that's right at the very heart of what your parliamentarian right. should be okay. doing. Um, Thank yeah. Thank you very much. Very good presentation. Thank you. How was the decision made whether to list somebody as an author or to list that person under the with the assistance of line? Yeah, um, that was that's just something that the RRA does. I'm sorry, that's the Roberts Rules Association. So this is the 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 authors. Uh, all of us are under contract to the Roberts Rules Association and the RRA holds the um, uh, copyright and uh, Quite simply, when Shmuel Gerber and I were asked to participate in the writing of the 11th edition, we were just handed a contract, which was in all respects identical, all material respects identical to the contracts held by Henry Robert, uh, Burke Balsh, and Dan Hunneman, except that it said that our names would appear underneath the words with the assistance of. And I suspect the reason for that was if I had made myself so thoroughly objectionable to the others that they didn't want to invite me back uh, for the next edition, it would be sort of less uh, uh, awkward if if I appeared to be some sort of a you know junior assistant or something like that. But it it had no bearing on how we operated. It's it's kind of a you know one for all and all for one uh, when we're actually working on it. Um, the uh, the the. 12th edition, the words with the assistance of have been removed, um, and it just bears the five authors' names. Congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question of our phenomenal presenter? Thank you so much, Dan, for doing this You're for welcome. us.